welcome, welcome you and I to another episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast, where we talk about Latino everything. Thank you very much for being here. Make sure you go and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much for the ones they already have. They continue to follow the content. Like us on all social media. Thank you so much. Very, 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 very much. I really, truly appreciate it. Today, we have an amazing gentleman in the building. He is an expert in business process and analyst, nonprofit leader and advocate for the Hispanic community and Hispanic empowerment, and also a CEO for an owner of Marquez Foundation and also a second generation business owner with expertise and experience in corporate and much more. Gilberto Ataide in La Casa. How you doing? Doing good, doing And good. I forgot to mention he's also part of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Forward Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Director uh, economic development. Economic development. He has a lot of titles that I can't keep up. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. Pleasure meeting you uh, at the chamber. And I, immediately when you, and I talk to you, I'm like, man, this man has a uh, great knowledge, great resources. His heart is right as far as helping the Latino Hispanic community. And I thought you would be amazing to be here. So thank you very much for being here. No, I appreciate it. It's great being here. I've, I've been I've been watching the show for a little bit. And yeah. I was like, man, this is great. The format is great, so I was yeah. like, this is, this is an honor. Don't let him fool you. He used to have his own thing going on on YouTube. You can find him. I've seen him. I've seen him. All. I've seen yeah. other videos, pretty much. Okay, we're going to start with a segment that I like to call Preguntas al Chile. Preguntas al Chile. You like this, if you like that. Preguntas al Chile. Are you ready? I'm ready. Estás listo. I'm ready. Tacos or tortas? Uh, tacos, for sure. Tacos. Love tacos. What kind? Where's your go-to? What uh, tipo? Tacos de bistec or al pastor. Al and pastor. typically, if I if I go to a place, I'm going to try both just to see how it is. Because some one? places got really good al pastor tacos, but some oh. places got, you know, bistec. So. <laughs> so far, which is the best place you found that has the best tacos for you? Oh, the best place is in Fort Worth mm -hmm. on 7th Street in... Um, uh, I forget, it's a little food truck there. Yeah. And it's always, there's always a huge line. Um, Does it got a name? I, salsa, no, limon something. It's not salsa limon, but it's something limon. Mm. I think I've seen the, it, it's always there on Saturday, 7th Street. If you're just passing by, like you'll see a huge line, like around 11, 11, 12 o'clock. That's awesome. So yeah. you know, you're in the right place. Corn tortilla, flour tortillas. Uh, corn tortillas. Gorditas or pupusas? Oh, that's a tough one because pupusas are good too. But <laughs> gorditas for sure. Because yeah. I, I remember growing up and I had an aunt that used to sell gorditas. Oh. So it was, it's nothing. When they're fresh, there's nothing like that. Yeah, that's true. That. Yeah. yeah. Mexican coca or jarrito? Probably coca. Yeah. The yeah. Mexican coca. Yeah, they do have a different flavor mm -hmm. than the American coca. Yeah. <laughs> Or oh, agua de horchata, Jamaica, or tamarindo. Oh, that's a good one too. Definitely agua de horchata, though. Yeah. Yeah, it, it goes. I think it goes better with the tacos. With the tacos. Yeah. What is? Uh, let me ask you this: What is the best water you have so far? From what place? Ooh. Um. There's a place in Arlington, uh, and it's a taqueria on Pioneer. It's a little like a, a little place. I don't even know if they have a name, but it's been there a really long time. And uh, they have the best salsa because it's really, really spicy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also have the best aguas. They have a couple, but the agua de horchata there is so good. Do you like the um, mom and pops, the little hole in the walls? Oh, like, yeah. Find. That's the way you, oh, yeah. where you find the best food. Uh, really we is. used to, my dad used to come home from uh, like panaderias. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of panaderias that sometimes serve food. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, brisket tacos, uh, brisket burritos are good too uh, from several different panaderias that we've had. But for sure... The, the little hole in the walls. But well, you can see find... yourself a foodie, somewhere uh, of a foodie, trying to discover maybe, some of the good spots. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. I try not to go to like the franchises yeah. if I can avoid it, you know? That's what. Yeah, if it's a, if with, if with, with the client or something, then yeah, we'll go somewhere a little bit more well known. But if it's by myself, I'm going to a little. Little That's places tough. that nobody goes to. What I tell you, man, this may be supporting the community. <laughs> okay, check it out. Salsa verde or salsa roja? I like both, but salsa verde. Salsa verde. Both, yeah. Team salsa verde all day, every day. Yep. Okay. Menudo or pozole? Oh, I like both too, but I, 
I'm gonna go with menudo. Yeah, menudo on the weekends or uh, uh, Sunday mornings. I think it hits the spot. <laughs> okay, another one. Where's your favorite spot to get some menudo locally in Fort Worth? It's a lady that makes it uh -huh. on Sundays, and she delivers. So we'll put an order in, and sometimes she'll bring it out to us. That's super low key. Yeah, that is the best one. Somebody is getting down somebody's mom with the amazing yep. thing. You can't get it nowhere. It's the best. Yeah, absolutely. Do they give you the so? When I got here to the States, it's the first time I ever tried menudo, but they used to give uh, with tostadas. Oh, and yeah. I know there's people that like bolillo, mm -hmm. or mantequilla, mm -hmm. or tortillas. What do you prefer? With uh, bolillo, for sure. And uh, usually without the hominy. Mm. I, I just like the meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it hits the spot. Yeah. Sure. I like I like the hominy. Not no more though. I retired in the but I used to like the hominy. <laughs> yeah. Valentina Tapatio Cholula hot sauce. Oh, Why? Just because I love chips and Valentina. Right? Yeah, you can put Valentina and everything, but Valentina, when you have chips and Valentina, that's the Do you ever throw a limon, in, a limon there? I, I have you ever had it, it? I've had it like that, but I think it's just good just like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it and it's really because it's uh, nostalgic. When I was a kid and I would visit, uh, both of my parents are from Zacatecas, mm. and uh, we'd go every summer, and I just remember getting the the... Uh, next door, because, you know, they have, like, little stores everywhere. Tienditas everywhere. Yeah, tienditas mm -hmm. everywhere. So, next door, you, you go and get your chips and, and salsa. Or after soccer games or after, like, all the time. Was it the chips, uh, the packaged chips, or was it the bolsita de plástico with the with the salsa? Uh, it was, if it was cueritos, it's with the, uh, mm. con la bolsa, like, and you put, put like it in there. Like a clear bag yeah, of like plastic. Clear bag. Yeah, And, uh... And they used to serve the Coke in the plastic bag, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They still do. They still do? Yeah, you'll find uh, it some places. That's yeah, crazy. so I was like, that. I don't know. It would always just hit the spot. So I wonder if... Okay, so I think it makes sense now that the bolsita with the soda is most likely a two liter and they just break it down into... Yeah, you know, little parts. Maybe think, why would they want to open a Coca, put it in a bag, and then give it to people? Entrepreneurs, know, they're trying to make bro, money. Bro, the most. <laughs> Norteñas or mariachi music, which one do you like best? Uh, I think mariachi music when it's a celebration, but uh, norteñas if you're if you're trying to party, <laughs> trying, to, trying to dance yeah. all night long. Yeah, this was way different, way off, not even the same client. Just like to entertain some fun question. A conspiracy theory that you heard one time. When you heard, you're like, man, I think that's true. Well, it might be true. What yeah. would that be? Yeah, I um. Uh, and I'm usually not big into conspiracies, but I, I saw the assassination of JFK. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like this is kind of weird that nobody found out. Well, they say it was uh, yeah, Oswald, right? Right. But, uh, but it seemed kind of off. Like we visited the place and I, it, I mean, it was like, it's crazy that nobody really like saw it. Right. And, uh, and I was like, I don't know. Like JFK was, was kind of, um, progressive maybe mm -hmm. and i was like you never know it might could have could have been an inside job so when you were in there and you were trying to assess everything like the math is not math in here yeah i was like i don't know about this one <laughs> could be yeah when you hear the word latino um latinx uh, latina what immediately first comes to mind to you um culture music art uh i think um just the way we kind of express ourselves right um but I think a combination of everything, just the the, the culture, just the food, yeah. um, just how we set ourselves apart. Absolutely. Do you consider yourself Latino? You Do you mind the term? you prefer Hispanic more, uh, Mexicano? Uh, what is better for you or does it matter to you? I think all three is fine. But um, if someone were to ask me, I would say I'm probably Mexican-American. Or Mexican I am Mexican-American. You are Mexican-American. Yeah, Mexican-American, Mexican roots. But I, I grew up here. I know the culture here. And I know the culture in Mexico, too. But Mexican-American, a combination of both. Chicano doesn't ring a bell to you as far as that? I For think, you? I think when I was growing up, um, yeah, I think that was a term that I would say I'm, I'm Chicano, you know. But I, I guess lately people don't use it as much. Yeah. Or at least not in Texas. Um, I've heard that maybe in California they use it a lot more, mm -hmm. but uh, recently I think um, it, it's kind of been going away. And um, but I mean, if someone called me Chicano, I, I wouldn't mind it either. Right, right. Yeah, that's pretty I'm cool. Chicano. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's get to the interview and get to know more about you. Again, I, I just know that you do great work. Um, immediately when I saw you, not to mention the things that I'd be looking into as far as what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. But let me just touch a little bit on your family. So your family's from Zacatecas. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know their journey? Do they have an interesting story? How your parents, how your mom got to the States? Yeah, so both of them got to the United States in the early 20s. Mm -hmm. I actually... Um, so I, my mom lived in El Paso. She married uh, somebody that was a resident in El Paso or a citizen in El Paso. And uh, she lived there until I was about three years old. Uh, but during that time, um, th there was some issues. He actually got involved with the wrong people mm, yeah. and, uh, and he got locked up. So she moved to Irving, Texas and um, with her sister, her sister had married a guy that was from her uh, hometown, which is uh, Rio Grande, Zacatecas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he had a brother and uh, that they were living together. And she ended up marrying uh, her her sister's husband's brother. Wow. So it was two sisters with two brothers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, my and he raised me since I was three years old. So I call him dad. Okay. So if you. You, you see my socials and everything, I'm a taide, but my uh, my mom, my stepdad, and my siblings are all Marquez. Marquez. Which led to Marquez Foundation. Okay. So we will <laughs> talk about that as well. Yeah. When you get a chance to take some pics, oh, you can could, you could leave it open. We ain't going to lie. We ain't going to cut nothing. Just kidding. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. So did you ever have any reconnection with your uh, biological father? Was there anything? No, I, I did not. And I think um, part of me wanted, at one point in my life, mm -hmm. wanted to reach out because I uh, just wanted to know who I was mm -hmm. and, and maybe if I can find family members. And but, um, but part of me was also not wanting to reach out because out of respect to my stepdad. Gotcha. He raised me. I call him dad. He calls me son. Of course, absolutely. So it was like I never really had that need because I, I got everything from my stepdad. Yeah, that's so, amazing. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I really respect that a lot. I, I appreciate you sharing because I, I know there's people that have similar stories. And, and I know I hear sometimes you hear on social media people talking about sometimes they have the urgency. But it's great that everything was provided to you um, out of respect of everything that he provided to you. Even, you know, some of the drive that you have. I'm pretty sure that's some something that shaped you oh, yeah. to be the person you are. That came from him for sure. Yeah. It, another thing that I find interesting about what you're telling me is like, some for some Latinos, some Hispanic people, they're not willing to share a story like that. Mm -hmm. Like your mom willing to say that oh, yeah. it would be like a secret, very, <laughs> and nobody would ever know that that happened. You know? Yeah. Well, how? How? I'm guessing your relationship with your mom is great that she was able, willing to open up and not keep it a secret, not ever be known that things like that happen. Yeah. Well, I um for sure um when I was growing up, maybe it was like fifth or sixth grade. I had a different last name, mm -hmm. so it it did prompt me to start questioning things a little bit. I'm like, why do I have a different last name? Like, this kind of doesn't make sense. And so it did get to a point where she had to have the conversation and be like, hey, well, this is kind of what happened. And I started asking more questions, and that's when I started to find out, like, what it was. But there was no resentment or anything. I mean, I, I grew up happy. My Both of my parents, I think, were very supportive. Yeah. Um, and they just did what they had to do to to keep moving forward. And uh, sometimes when I hear their their some of their like the journey or the struggle, it, it is it is what motivates me because if you think about it, they came from Mexico, not knowing people, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, not knowing any kind of resources, and they got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. They had to come here, try to figure it out, and somehow they made it work. Yeah. Uh, my dad was in construction for. Uh, maybe 15 years digging holes like foundation repair is a tough 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 mm -hmm. job yeah digging holes all the time and um and i think about that and sometimes like you're like man i get to i get to go to a job where i have ac all day that's a blessing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that in itself i think is a blessing and um and he tells me all the time it was like it must be nice having a little office job and i was like well you know you did a like, great work. You did a great <laughs> job erasing me and do better for myself. Yeah, you know, that, just that, advance. <laughs> exactly. But that was because of him, you know? Yeah, of course. I think he, he kind of understood how I was growing up and he, he would challenge me a lot of times. And so I would go to work with him during the summer times 
And uh, and he would tell me, I was like, look, if you don't want to get stuck here doing what I'm doing, you got to go to school and get a degree and got to figure something else out. Yeah. And that kind of prompted me at a very, I mean, we, I was probably like 12 years old when I was, started helping him out with a couple of things. Okay. Uh, before I jump off that subject, so when you had the conversation of that, how old were you at that time when you had that conversation? And was there... I mean, is it, I mean, depending on how old you are, either you understand it, you don't understand it, mm -hmm. or what's happening. I know you said there was no resentment. Was, is there anything in there for you that helped you push through? Like, you know, this is what life is for me right now. Yeah. No, I, I was maybe like 12 years old. Mm. Um, remember 12 years old? It, I didn't really, uh, grasp it. Like I, I was like, okay, I guess that's it. Is, that is what it is. And then when you start getting older, that's when I started realizing, I was like, oh, there was like, there was a lot going on, you know, Yeah, yeah. there was a lot going on. And I can't imagine being in my mom's shoes, single mom and, you know, not knowing anybody or the language. And, uh, she actually did get a, a job as a housemaid in El Paso at mm -hmm. one point. Wow. So she was, um, uh, she, she used to tell me all the time that, you know, um, she lived in the house that she was working in. Cause I think it was more common mm -hmm. back in the days. And, um, and she would just tell me just, you know, she would put me on a crib and just, put something for me to play with and just say, all right, just don't make a lot of noise. Wow. And I was, I was a really quiet kid. So That's great. it worked out, <laughs> <laughs> but it is kind of crazy to think like what she had to go through. Absolutely. Shout out to your moms. Okay. So your dad encouraged you, he pushed you to go to school. So they were pretty encouraging as far as uh, getting to, for you to get an education, right? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's because really my dad knew how to push my buttons a little bit mm. and he knew I was kind of competitive. And, uh, so it did get to a point where I was like, all right, dad, I'm looking for colleges. I'm applying for this. And then I told him the price of some of those colleges. And then he got, to, he, he basically flat out said, well, that's a lot of money. I can't pay for that. So you got to figure that out. And I was like, and if you can't, you know, uh, so it was weird because he would push me to go towards it. Mm -hmm. Then he was like, all right, now figure this out. And, uh, but that did encourage me. And so right after high school, I went to a Midwestern state mm -hmm. and because, I saw how much he did in a, uh, in a business because, uh, and let me retract a little bit. He actually worked like 15, 16 years on his own for a foundation repair company. Mm -hmm. And then with his friends, he started his company, uh, okay. his foundation repair business. And, uh, what is their name? Uh, Juan Marquez, my dad and, uh, Raul Lopez was probably his long-term associate. They still work together. And, um, and so they started that business and I was like 13, 14 years old and I was helping. Actually, that's when I, you remember that uh, software program paint. No, I don't. You it don't? doesn't ring a bell right now. You know? but. So uh, was it Microsoft? Uh -huh. Anyways, there's a software paint. That's it sounds like paint. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it was a Microsoft program. Yeah. And uh, so I, I used to draw like little layouts and yeah. stuff on there. And yeah. he was like, you know, draw me a little layout because they want this contract or whatever. And I was putting... It was basically like a little box and some circles of where, where we're going to dig <laughs> the holes. And that's what they presented? That's how they presented it. Really? And he was getting jobs. That was, that was, that's pretty crazy. That's work. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Imagine another person competitor that doesn't have that. And even that, even if it's just like not crazy it's complicated, yeah. but still more visual to the customer. Like, oh, yeah. I get it. Yeah. So it's pretty <laughs> funny. So I've seen contracts. Actually, I've uh, seen some houses where they, so we issue out like a warranty. And I've seen some houses where they have that warranty and it's my dad's signature from like 15 years ago. I was like, serious? this is crazy. That's yeah. wild. So what was the cool. name of their company? Uh, it's always been Marcus Foundation. Marcus Foundation? Yeah, Marcus Foundation Repair. Mm -hmm. And then when I opened mine, tribute to him, I said, I'm just going to put it Marcus Foundation. Marcus Foundation. Yeah. Okay. So I remember uh, talking to you a little while back in regards to your journey on, on going to school because... I don't know if there was anybody that was helping you through either scholarships, if you were working or how is it? Where did you find the, uh, if it, it was anybody to help you to kind of sort of guide you to where you needed to go to, to get either financial aid or I'm pretty sure you were, I don't know if you were the first one in your family to go to college, but there's a lot of things to figure out if you're the first one. Yeah, I was the first one. Um, a lot of stuff I had to kind of figure out on my own, mm -hmm. but I always had that, uh, that notion. I was like, I got to go find the answers. So I did participate in um, a program in high school where they, you know, visit different colleges. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get an idea, like each college has a different culture. So you got to go one to that that will fit you. Yeah. 
And I was looking more for like smaller universities. Um, but it's, it's intimidating because we didn't really have a, a lot of money growing up. Right. And I'm sitting there applying for colleges and then they say, okay, you're, you're applying for this financial <clears> aid <throat> and the university is going to be like $10,000 a year or something. And as a kid, you really don't understand, especially if you come from a family that doesn't know, you know, you don't really understand how much you're putting yourself into. You're like, yeah. I don't know how much $10,000 is or yeah. $50,000 if, if I'm doing like a four year program. And so right it was, now it's super cheap though, but <laughs> <laughs> can I get those throwback prices back? Yeah. 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 That's, but it's crazy. And then, so I just, I really just took a leap of faith yeah. and I was like, okay, I'll just, you know, <clears throat> we'll apply for this financial aid. We'll apply for this loan. Um, luckily my first year was paid off because uh, I had the Pell Grant and there was a lot of things that helped me out. Like a lot of things because the Pell Grant was one. Um, Maybe even like affirmative action a little bit. Yeah. Because I, I went to a majority minority school. Mm, okay. And, um, and, uh, and I wasn't, um, I wasn't as, I mean, there's isn't not a lot that you can put on, on a resume when you're applying for a college or university, or at least I didn't have that at the time. Yeah. And so I wasn't the, I wasn't as studious as I guess I am now. Like I kind of changed that over the past couple of years. But I did, uh, I was good at testing and that's what helped me out. And I was right there on that margin. <laughs> so for you, okay. Cause I was the same way. I didn't no extracurricular besides soccer. That's what and I had. No, no need to go into yeah. be part of this group, be part of that group. You know, it's just nothing yeah. for me like that. Did that really, for, in your experience, for anybody that's applying for college, how important is it for you to be able to get those things? Because I didn't even know you needed a resume to go to college to get it ready f for them to, for you to submit so they can even look at you and see if they were to accept. I'm just thinking they want your money, but that's not the case, right? No, I mean, it does help out because, and I think it more so helps out on you and expanding your choices. Mm -hmm. Because when I was applying, I didn't even know what, like, um, like I applied for a business to, to a business school, right? But I didn't know the difference between marketing and accounting and anything else. I just knew I was like, okay, business, you know. And I think if you participate in like extracurricular curricular things mm -hmm. or you're volunteering in the community, right. you get to meet a lot of people in different career fields. And that's the one thing I did not have at all. So just having those conversations with different people doing different things would have opened your eyes to different stuff that you could have applied for. Yeah, absolutely. Different mm. professions, different ideas. Uh, maybe it wasn't, maybe I didn't need to go to college. You know, maybe I did need to like just work with another entrepreneur for a couple of years or something and just kind of go from there. But, um, I'm glad I made the choice. And, uh, and when I was in college, I actually learned a lot about myself. I realized I had no idea how to study. Mm -hmm. Like my first semester was terrible. And, um, and I had, I had to change that. I talked to a few people in the dorms cause I lived in the dorms. And, uh, and I realized that my study technique was I had to read one page, write notes, and then, uh, just go through the whole chapter or book. And then, uh, to study it, I would go back and just highlight the things that were important. And then make additional notes on my notes. Mm. This means that, or okay. this means that. And then I'm digesting it. And that was the way I learned uh, all four and a half years. That's how I studied. Who was the one that introduced you to that method or realized that that's the way that for you was the best way for you to learn? It was a, it was a good friend of mine that I met in, um, in the dorm rooms. Yeah. Um, I know, uh, there was a, so Jared Smythe. If he's watching, <laughs> yeah, so he kind of helped a little bit with that. And, um, and it was really just talking to different people. It was like, Hey, what do you do? And, uh, and started forming like study groups. And that's when I realized like study groups help out a lot too, because, uh, you get the perspective of someone else when they think like, I read this and this is what I think it means. And then you're like, Oh, you know what? You might be right. And, uh, and so then you write that on your notes and you're like, and when you're going through the exams, you're you're comparing and contrasting and trying to figure out like what's the best fit. That's cool. Yeah, and there's uh there was a professor that was tricky though. That he would give you um uh, a question that was like a paragraph long. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember this in my marketing class, like a paragraph long, and then he would give you like six or seven different answer choices, mm -hmm. and then he would ask you which one's the best answer. And you're sitting there looking at that question like, 
all of them seem right. Like, which one's the best one? So I think when you start having that dialogue with somebody else, that's what really helps because you're like, okay, this makes more sense because X, Y, and Z. You know, you're really... little phrases, little words that makes a difference to be like, yeah, this will be the best. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, that's tough. Were you working at that time also or were you just depending on financial aid, loans, or different things that you got? Yeah, I was working at... uh, I was working at Sears most you, of the four years. Oh, nice. Uh, do they still have Sears? Yeah, I there still was a few. They call few. it something freight now. Freight something. Yeah, I was it's working. A, it's a different story now. It's something freight something. Harbor. Freight Harbor. Freight Harbor. Or Harbor Freight. One of the two. It's a Sears store technically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I worked at Sears. Uh, and I actually really liked working there because I got introduced into sales at Sears. So what department were you? Uh, at first, I started out as a cashier. Uh-huh. And uh, they had little incentives, like if you uh, sign people up for credit cards, you get $5 or $10. And so I had a part-time job. I was like, I mean, every person that comes in here, I'm going to try to offer it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, every little uh, money helps, yeah, little especially money. when you go to school, you know. Exactly. It could be the difference between having a maruchan of uh, sopa or maybe McDonald's for that day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, and you know what? Like, I was I was thinking about, about it like that because yeah. sometimes I would even budget out my week. And let's just say I wanted to have spaghetti. I would say, okay, the spaghetti is going to cost me $10 and it's going to be about three meals. And so each one of my meals is going to be at $3. Mm-hmm. And I would think about it like that because I was like, I got to make sure I have enough at the end of the week. What did you start realizing that budgeting was a thing that you need to implement as you're doing your your student and being a student, being a college student at that time? Who introduced you to that? Or you just think about it, like, I need to be able to be better with my money to structure it correctly. Otherwise, I'm not gonna have a meal <laughs> yeah yeah i think it was just i i, I knew i had to do it mm. i knew how to do it especially after the first year so my first year was paid off and everything but the second year i was like i gotta make sure i i'm a lot more uh in tune on what like how am i spending on everything yeah. and i didn't have a lot so i had to make sure that i gotta have enough to eat you know yeah. and so um so i gotta get better at selling credit cards <laughs> <laughs> and i gotta budget a lot better but then they offer you a position to do another sales job there or, or just a credit card part? Yeah. So I got so good at selling credit cards. <laughs> they were like, we got to put you on a sales team. And uh, and then I started selling. Uh, I got moved into electronics mm. and I started selling TVs and I started selling uh, uh, some dishwashers and stuff, but mostly TVs. TVs was my thing. Like if anybody could ask me anything about TVs, I I had it down. Was it plasmas at that time, or was it was it? There was the plasmas. are freaking heavy thing. Yeah, they're heavy. They're Don't really leave it heavy. on in the same screen, you'll regret it. There was plasmas. Uh, I think LEDs were being introduced, and they had some LEDs. But um, but the thing that helped me out there a lot too was mm-hmm. because I knew uh, English and Spanish, and I had both types of clientele coming Man. in. Yeah, so I, I did really really well. So four hour shift. You sell one TV, you're making, you know, you're good $200, $300 for that day. Just like that. Yeah. So it was nice. That was awesome. Yeah. Okay. So you fast forward three years now. Uh, okay. One question before that. During that time, mm-hmm. college students, you know, maybe you're away from the house. Maybe you never had freedom before. Are you trying to focus? But there's a lot of distractions. How oh, did yeah. you keep being disciplined or just knowing that you needed to stay focused on school and not be oh, distracted yeah. with maybe partying or not or maybe you know you put it in the budget yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> to get out you know to celebrate here and there yeah yeah and i did go out um it got to a point where when i was doing better in sales i did get a chance to go out a couple of times but that could jeopardize your studies too though so yeah. you have to have a balance oh absolutely you have to have that balance what helped me out a lot is I just hung out with the right people. Mm. There's some people that won't make it to four, four and a half years. And so I just wanted to make sure I hung out with people who were like dedicated to finishing and uh, and that they have a balance and it helped me out too because they're not encouraging me like, hey, let's go do this. And, um, and the other thing is just making sure that you just have that discipline to go home every single day after class and take the time to study a couple of hours. Where do those things come from? Because I know you say those are decisions that you're making, but, but the budgeting part, the hanging around with the right crowd, where does that mentality come from? Where did you hear it? Did your parents, anybody? Yeah, I think on the back of my head, I was like, if I fail college, mm. I am 10, 15, 20K down the hole, you know? And then I have to go home and tell people I didn't make it. And then you have to get a job and try to figure it out. And I was like, I just didn't want to, I want to give myself the best chance. I didn't want to come home and look like, you know, I just couldn't make it, you know? 
And I didn't like that feeling. So I was like, nah, there's no matter what, I have to figure it out. I have to make it. And that kept pushing me forward. And I was like, I keep getting better. I get a, uh, it makes me think of something that happened when I was in the military and I joined the military. I told, um, I was working at a grocery store and then one of the cashiers there, she was a, somebody I knew. Mm-hmm. And she said, Oh, if you make it, it'll be okay. And it wasn't like I was trying to prove it wrong, but yeah. I'm like, even though when it got difficult, I'm like, I'm not about to go home and tell them that I <laughs> fell out of boot camp yeah. and I couldn't make it out. Like, yeah. Irrelevant to hers. Yeah. But just the thought of it'll be okay to come back and nothing. No, that it's was tough. not going to be an option. Yeah. And it was so whatever I could, I pushed through the pain, the yelling, whatever. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Why would I? I don't want to come back and be a failure. I know it'll be all right. Yeah. But still, no, it just wasn't an option. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, I got to give it my best. And, and this, the last thing that I'm going to do is to leave, you know, That's awesome. to quit. How does it feel whenever you know you got enough credits, everything's getting set up, you're starting to go through arrangements of getting everything situated for your graduation? How does it start feeling for you? And finally, when you get to walk to the stage, when you get to call your mom, your dad, and let them know, hey, I'm going to graduate. Yeah. And can I make some arrangements to be there or were they able to even be there? Yeah, yeah. They did attend. It definitely was the best feeling in the world. But I got I got chills whenever they're doing the... The, the speech, the graduation speech, mm-hmm. and um, the guy, and I forget his name, but it was a professor that he talked about, you know, you guys, when you leave here, you're not just leaving here with a diploma, a degree, or a better job, mm-hmm. but moving forward, you guys are the leaders in the community, and it's up to you to shape it how you want. And it gave me chills, sure, and I was like... chills too, bro, just the way you say it. Yeah, like, so I was like, you know what? He's right, you know? And when I go back, to my community and I, you know, I grew up in a, in a, a neighborhood that's mostly, you know, Hispanic dominant. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dang, I am a leader. Like I do have to set an example. And that's, it's an, another added pressure after you graduate. Mm. And that, that kind of helped me shape my career. And what do your parents, your dad I and mean, your mom say whenever they. Oh, they're see. super, super proud. Yeah. Super proud. Definitely. My mom was, was crying a lot when mm-hmm. I left because mm-hmm. I, I was, um, you know, there full time. And, uh, but after they were, they were really, really proud. Yeah. And, uh, and it was actually crazy because, uh, as soon as I, I got done graduating, uh, my dad was like, well, you know, maybe we could switch your, uh, last name to Marquez. And I started bawling because it was like the first time I felt like, I don't know, I had accomplished something and I, I made the family proud. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was like a little sense of like belonging. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was like, it was a really, really great feeling. Awesome. I can I can sense it. I can feel it yeah. on you. How how beautiful that moment was for you. Absolutely. It's yeah. amazing. Okay, so you get to finally you get to the you know, I always find it funny to me when jobs mm-hmm. require you experience when you just further graduate. It's like a cash twenty two. How am I gonna have experience with anything if I'm just barely graduating and have my degree, you know? Oh, yeah. I have the degree, but of course I don't have no work experience because I'm gonna be busy with schooling. Yeah. You know, so they, they require some of the experience. So how was the struggle for you to try to find something? Because eventually you did find a job, right? Oh yeah. Eventually found it, but it wasn't something that I was planning. And I actually right after college, I I was really disappointed mm. because I could not find a job. My focus was marketing, and I actually thought about doing design and working for this, uh, like, uh, different marketing agencies. Yeah. And I actually, I went to an interview. Um, the guy was, the guy was kind of rude. Mm. Uh, he went through a couple of questions. <clears throat> yeah. And after he went through those questions, uh, at the end of the re- interview, I remember him saying, he said, uh, I interview these, uh, students from locally and, they all gave me terrible answers. I thought you'd be different because you're coming from a different city or from like Wichita Falls at the time. Mm-hmm. I was like, dang, that's messed up. So I, you know, it was a, it's a, it's like a, a punch in the gut, mm-hmm. like a reality check that I have not made it anywhere. Even after this degree, I have to figure this out again. So did you even finish the interview with that gentleman? Or you just walked out of a couple of questions. No, after a couple of questions, he said, he basically said, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, like, Even more rude. Yeah, he was rude. <laughs> Straight he, up. And he got up and, and so I was like, dang, that was messed up. So I left like just thinking like what happened, you know? Yeah. What happened? What am I doing wrong? Um, I, I My parents don't really have a lot of connections, so I really do have to start applying everywhere. 
And, uh, and then with that added pressure that now I'm in a lot of debt and I got to figure out how to pay this off in the next six months or mm -hmm. at least start paying it off in six months. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was pretty tough. But I remember I was good in sales. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll take a sales position. Right. And, uh, and eventually I found a, um, I started working at farmer's insurance and I found the position at, uh, at a district office. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was going to paid like 10 bucks an hour with a college degree, but wow, yeah, but, uh, the guy was, um, very successful. He had about 15, 16 agencies at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I could learn a lot from this guy. And so he kind of became a little bit of a, of a, of a mentor while I was there. Yeah. But it's really where I, I tried to focus on my weaknesses. And I said, maybe I, I just have to get really, really good in sales and that'll get me another position. You know what? I like your mentality of you is that even though it's challenging, you always see the opportunity. What can I learn from here and, and make me better? In addition to the importance of mentor, even though maybe he's not technically a mentor, but mm -hmm. let me have him mentor me without him knowing to get the most that I can and, and make me better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have to find it, especially if you don't have any resources, you got, I just got to pick people's brains and see mm -hmm. what works for them. Yeah. And I saw that he was successful. So I was like, all right, let me, I'll try this out and see how it works out. Okay. So you keep working, uh, United Health at one time it comes to that. Yeah. So, um, I was there 10 bucks an hour. It got to a point where I was like, you know what? I saw a lot of um, agents or people studying for the licenses, becoming agents. And so I took the test. I passed both exams, the life and health and the property and casualty. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I basically I told them, hey, I'm going to jump into the agent role. And I jumped into it. And I had a that was a whole another challenge, too, because you got to try to find clients as a 21 year old kid. I'm yeah. scrawny like nobody's going <laughs> to. Nobody's going to be take me seriously, you yeah, know, of course. But uh, but it was funny because I figured out that I just had to get really, really good on the phone mm. because you can't tell what age I am. If I get on the phone and I start talking to you about insurance, like, you're like, OK, this guy make your voice this. a little deeper, too. Yeah, make your voice <laughs> a little deeper. <laughs> hey. I was like, you have to you have to figure it out. So uh, I did that. And uh, I actually got pretty good. It got to a point where I was selling some policies every single month. And there were certain metrics that you had to hit. Mm -hmm. And so I hit my metrics. And the, at the time, they had a program where they said, if you, I think it was like 40 policies and four life policies per month, we can offer you a loan to open up your own insurance office. Oh, wow. And so it was like, I don't know how much it was. I think it was like a little bit over 100,000, somewhere around there. And, uh, and they gave me the peppers to sign and I looked at it and for whatever reason, just something told me it wasn't right. Or mm -hmm. at least it didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I, I have this school loans and now I'm going to sign another, you know, hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, I, I feel like I'm going to get stuck in this for 15 and 20 years. And I haven't explored everything I wanted to explore. Mm -hmm. And so, cause really I only got good at sales at that point. And so, um, it's a great skill to have. It's a great, it's skill, a great skill, yeah. skill to have. Absolutely. And then yes. some people make it with sales. Like yeah. this, is, this is amazing. But I just had this like uh curiosity. I was like, well, if, if I got done this much with what I had, like imagine if I learned a little, a few more things. And so it was a uh, sales season for health insurance. And, uh, it was probably during, it was Obama that passed the affordable care act. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know what, there might be a lot of uh, growth and opportunity in the health insurance field because maybe that's the way I can get promoted to different things. You got to find something that's growing. Right. And so I was like, I'll jump into that. I um I, I received an email or a, a position at a call center mm -hmm. selling uh, Medicare Advantage plans. Right. Which is, uh, um, it, it's part of it. It's part of, um, it's health insurance, but it's a, it's a plan that adds on to your Medicare. Okay. So additional to. Additional to. So okay. it includes dental, vision, hearing, uh, and anybody aging into Medicare typically needs some kind of that supplement. And so, uh, I went into that. It was just a, um, it was just a contract for like six months during mm -hmm. the season. And we were supposed to be let go after that. But they were paying well. I think at the time it was like 18 bucks an hour. 18 from yeah. 10 is a big difference. Yeah, it's a big difference. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'll jump into it. We'll see how it goes. And then uh, I went into it. I actually hated it because I felt like I was a machine. Mm. Like every time the phone rang, the little, I still remember that little beep. 
And then you just had to go. You just had to go. And then every time you signed up an application, you had this long script that you had to yeah. do. And I remember reading it so many times that I would have dream about it. So I felt like I never left work. You yeah. go home, you you know, you rest and you're dreaming about it. Then you come back to work and you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. It takes me back to the first time I ever became a dishwasher. <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't realize besides washing the dishes, you had to wash all the other dishes and nobody told me they left them in the aisle yeah. until it's almost time for us to go. And then all of a sudden I look around and like, Oh yeah, we're ready to go. Let's go. And like, Hey, what about the, those right there? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I look over and there's a freaking line of dishes that oh, I have not washed. So I stayed extra an hour yeah. in addition to my regular shift to finish. Yeah. But that night. Uh huh. Stacks and stacks and stacks of oh, dishes, yeah. bro. Yeah. I was like, "What the?" <laughs> and I, I feel on? you on that yeah. that 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 script. Is this freaking dishes, bro? It's like over and over okay. and over. But during that time, uh, you started seeing some things and in, in other opportunities you might be able to dive into with that opportunity, right? Yeah. Okay. The the biggest thing is, you know, I told myself I got two options. Um, I can call it quits, or I can try to move up. Mm -hmm. And so I did always do my best to stand out in a crowd. And uh, and it was funny because maybe it was destiny, but um, six months after the project was done, mm -hmm. they kept 30 agents out of 170-something, and I was one of them. You made the cut. I made the cut. <laughs> they were like, hey, we're offering you an extension. Uh, some things are coming down the line, and uh, and we'd like to keep some of you for the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. I was like, great, I'll, I'll stay on a little bit longer. And um, and it was probably during that time where our call center got purchased, got bought out by Optum, which is a sister company of United Healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but it was good because Optum is a huge company. I mean, um, I think if there were United Health Group is a is an umbrella of companies. If you take Optum by itself, they're probably like Fortune twelve. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're more so in uh, data and and um, in analysis, but. Um, they were experimenting with the project and, and we were part of it. Awesome. And so I was like, this is great. So I, I jumped into it and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll keep doing this. Uh, and then they switched us over to a campaign where it was mostly service instead of sales. But at the time I was thinking about it, I was like, well, I got really good in sales. Let me see if I can get really good on service on, um, uh, on that side. Cause I have no idea what it looks like. Right. Right. And so, yeah, I just took it as a learning opportunity and just kind of went from there. Okay. Now, during this time at all, are you even thinking about entrepreneurship? Is the bug biting you a little bit that you may want to go ahead and start your own thing at all? Is there money coming in? Maybe that you got a little extra that you can maybe start building something or not yet? When does Marcus Foundation technically becomes a thing? Yeah. So I, um, I did start a company when I was around that age. Uh, it was a failure. <laughs> what was it? What was the name and what was it? Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing, but I was, uh, I was into fitness because I was trying to, I was 150 pounds. I was like, I need to put on some muscle. So I started going to the gym a lot and stuff. And, uh, and then, uh, a friend of mine, I told him, Hey, what if we start? I was like, I need to meet a lot more entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to see what kind of business I want to start. How do I get in? And then I started thinking, well, every entrepreneur needs marketing. They need a t shirt or a t shirt or something, you know? And I said, well, let's start a t shirt business. And then, uh, and then the idea kept evolving, evolving after that. And then I said, you know what? Maybe we should start t-shirts for, um, uh, we'll do all kinds of t-shirts, but we'll do t-shirts for, uh, people that go to the gym. And we called it, uh, muscle covers. <laughs> muscle covers? Muscle covers. Yeah. Okay. That was the name of the company. That was the name of the business. Yeah. And it was going to be the, the branding for that, but you were still going to print for other stuff if they want it. Exactly. Okay. Why did you want to become an entrepreneur? I can't even say the word entrepreneur. Why, knowing that you have a steady job, knowing that you know you're working to better yourself in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you know your dad is one. Where does it come from to make you even want to try to experiment on the shirts? Yeah, it just it, the nine to five just wasn't enough. Like I, uh, it got to a point where I was learning a lot, but it wasn't really the thing that fulfilled me. Mm. And. Uh, but I took it as like my nine to five is my learning opportunity because if a corporate company does it, I want to learn how they did it. Mm -hmm. And I want to learn as much as I can from every single area. And so if I leave here and I become an entrepreneur, I should be an expert. And that's really, that was my whole mentality. 
I ended up staying at United Healthcare eight and a half years. Mm. And that was my whole mentality throughout the thing. Just learning, learning, Just learning. learn, learn, learn as much as I can. And if I find somebody that's amazing, pick their brain. And so I switched over from, and it helped me out a lot because people saw that I was ambitious and I got promoted in those eight and a half years, I got promoted about five times. Wow. So I went from um, agent to coach to supervisor to uh, a business analyst and then um, and then senior business process analyst. Wow. Which is handling like bigger contracts uh, with the federal and state and then putting processes together for all the call centers. To process yourself together for the other call centers. Yeah, wow. for the call centers. Imagine, and you started just by learning, having the desire to learn as much as you can, having to learn opportunity, and then do that. Yeah. How long did the t-shirt be- business last, and why did it dissolve? You and your partner just, just it wasn't it. Yeah, after, uh, we actually, so we, it was fun to pick it up. Like, I learned how to do screen printing yeah. and all of that. But then it got to a point where we had a bit of big order from a church. It was like 300 shirts and we had to get it done like in a week or something. Uh-huh. And uh, I remember coming home from work and I, it was so repetitive. And I think that's the thing that I dislike a lot. Repetitive. Yeah. Repetitiveness. If it's too repetitive, I'm going to check out. Mm-hmm. And so I was like sitting there going, you know, 50 shirts a day. Yeah, like the script. Yeah. Did you have a nightmare that day yeah. about prison? <laughs> <laughs> so I was nightmares about prison on t-shirts <laughs> after that. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? This is not going to work out, you know, and it's not enough, uh, I always thought it's it's good if you have an employee and they're doing the work and, you know, you're the business owner and you're like, okay, I can oversee this. But when you're doing it yourself, you're like, I can't just add another task after my job mm-hmm. and then not get enough for me to say, like, it's worth it. Was it any fulfillment at all either to do it? Even though, you, you know, you're doing maybe making a, some money, but mm-hmm. it's just like, what am I really doing? Yeah, it's it's fulfilling in the sense that you're like, oh, wow, like at the end of the day. We only had the company for about a year, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, I did learn a lot about the industry. Nice. I learned a lot about the industry. I found out where to get supplies. Uh, I found out best processes. And then, um, and it was just a feeling afterwards. They're like, Hey, if I ever need to go back to that, I guess I could. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, like a little bit of security that if I get fired, you know, I can, I can still make it. Make shirts. Yeah. I can okay. make shirts, I guess. What is the uh, next adventure as far as business? Why? What, when Marcus Foundation comes to be, was there any other businesses that you experimented at all? Uh, so that was it. And then, um, I really enjoyed my eight and a half years. I kept getting promoted. I love learning. And then it was probably during the COVID season where I felt like, I needed to make a change in my community. Mm-hmm. And I, it probably goes back to, you know, the, the graduation speech and being yeah. a leader. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, and, and you're working in that environment. You really don't have the opportunity to go out and, and just be in the community or be mm-hmm. visible or, you know. And so I was like, I, I want a career switch. It got to a point where I was like, I just wanted a career switch. And um, and that's when I said, I'll probably pick up Marcus Foundation. Uh, my dad had an associate uh, that was doing all of his marketing mm-hmm. uh, at that point, but he had just, re- he said that during COVID he retired. And so I told him, Hey, I'll, I'll pick it up. You know, I'll help you out with it. You know, I know the business, I know the work. It, it won't be too hard. And yeah. so I started going to networking events mm-hmm. and then I show up to one networking event where it was a, it was actually a brand new chamber of commerce. It was the greater North Texas Hispanic chamber of commerce. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I told the, the, the chair at the time, it was like, Hey, I won't want to volunteer. I want to help you guys out, but I, I want to be a board member. Like I want to contribute to this. And, uh, you know, she, you know, started picking my brain on a few things in marketing and, uh, and she liked those ideas. I became a board member and it was probably one year into it where I really wanted to challenge myself. And I said, you know what? I have all this corporate experience. I have sales experience. I can apply this and see if I can make this thing grow. And uh, at the time, um, so I really just took a leap of faith and I said, I'm going to quit my full-time job and see where I can take this. So did they hire you? Because technically it's a non-profit, right? It's a non-profit. It's a non-profit, all the funding. I don't know if there's any government funding or anything or everything that you are, you are getting from members and different things that you do is how you kind of sort of get it running. Yeah, it's uh, it was... 
I, it was basically another sales position. Mm -hmm. I was making a commission based on the memberships that I was bringing in. Okay. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. Uh, we started out, when I quit, we started, we had about 20 members. It was small, like mm -hmm. real small. We're just having little networking events. Wow. Uh, I did it for two years. Like I had a lot of savings. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those savings, I was like, I'm going to see if I can make this grow. And if I can make this grow, it'll be like a big accomplishment for me. In those two years, I got it to where we had about 200 members. 200 members. Yeah. So, and uh, we had a lot of events throughout the year and we had a, we had great momentum uh, at the time. Yeah. I seen you had a Cinco de Mayo event. You were on videos. Yeah. Uh, doing uh, Zoom calls too. Yeah. Uh, with different people that, um, one of our shout out to Christian Rocha. Yeah. Chris Rocha. He was here, but he was part of it as well. And all y'all were doing just, you know, Zoom calls and, and events and different things like that to grow it. Yeah. So two year run, you, you did it. Two years. And, uh, and I think that was the biggest benefit. I did meet a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were um, just, um, I don't know if it was inspiration, but they just saw that I was really trying to make this work. Mm -hmm. And so I did get a, a group of people that believed in the mission, believed in it and, uh, and helped us out. So were you able to be a board member and still be part of the chamber? Um, so it got to a point where I had to leave my board member position and because it'll be a conflict mm -hmm. of interest. So I left the board member position and I said, I'll be the first, I guess, executive director. So that was your position at that time? Yeah. For, for Until you left two years mm -hmm. and then something else comes. Yeah. So it, the, and during those two years, I was growing Marcus Foundation. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll grow Marcus Foundation. Um, and then, so I got done with the two years and then I got to a point where um, the, the, um, that chamber was, it's just a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work. You're stressed out. You're like, I have to focus on one thing, you know, and what's the thing that's bringing me more money? Marcus Foundation right now. Okay. And so I actually had the idea of, um, just focusing on the foundation repair business, but I, I quit. And on this very same day, it, I don't know if it was like the stars aligning or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, but, uh, Annette had reached out from the Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber and she said, Hey, I'm looking for, um, you know, somebody that can do X, Y, and Z. Um, I'm, somebody is, is leaving that position and I've seen some of the work that you do. And, uh, and I'd love to have you, uh, uh, work over here. Yeah. And then I thought about it. I was like, you know what? I, now I want the experience. Uh, of not working with a starter chamber, but a chamber that's been around for 50 plus years. 50 plus years with like 800 members. Or 830 plus, plus members. members. Yeah. And growing out to today, they're going to grow up more. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Huge events, uh, turnouts of 200, 300 people. Yeah. And so I was like, I wonder what I can do with this. And, uh, and so I've been there for four and a half months, super happy about everything that's been happening and a great team that we've uh, built or that Annette put together, um, but we've been building it. And so I'm really, really excited about what we can do in the next year. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I, part of the chamber, that's yeah. how I got to meet you, but I thoroughly love what y'all do. The whole chamber, everybody, the whole, everything. I never even know what that chamber was, you know? Yeah. So happened to be that <laughs> a regular position, a regular <laughs> nine to five that I've been doing sometimes. Yeah. So happened to be that, uh, I'm like, well, let me be part of it. I don't even know what it is, but let me find out what they do. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Because I will use it here, but you don't know what the benefit is as like a regular person or an entrepreneur. What, 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 what is even the chamber? What, what, what do they contribute? What do they do? You know, so to simplify that doesn't, somebody that doesn't know what a chamber is, you've been working with what? What is the resources mainly, mainly that one can get out of it? Whether it be just to know whether you're in the community or whether you are an entrepreneur, there's one and two. You either you already started your business, want to start a business, or even how to get started. What are the things that the chamber can help with? Uh, so there's a lot of stuff, but I tell people definitely get a chance to meet other entrepreneurs because if you start a business, you're going to need advice from an accountant. You're going to need advice from an attorney. Hopefully not, but you're going to hopefully have them on your side, right? Or mm -hmm. know somebody that can kind of help you out if you get stuck in a situation mm -hmm. or to prevent anything from happening. Um, and you really, you're just wanting to learn from as many people as you can with different experiences, because that'll help you shape your business. And you get a few ideas from everybody. I learn from everybody that I talk to. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
But the other thing too is um, the thing that helped out Marcus Foundation when I just started it is that I found a plumber, a structural engineer, an uh, insurance agent, a uh, banker at the time, and we were all passing business to each other. So if you think about it, that's a lot more effective than a lot of different marketing techniques because that insurance agent has 300 people, clients, uh, that engineer has 200 clients, that other person has 200 clients. And if you just meet once a month just to like talk about, hey, I can send you this one and you can send me that one. And uh, that will probably be about 30% of your business referrals. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's a big thing. So we have networking events every single month and that's really to get people to connect. We can connect with resources in our membership. Uh, but that's one thing. The second thing that's kind of unique about this chamber is that we have uh, business consultations. Mm -hmm. And I actually sit down with you and we assess where you are in your business. So we talk about your business plan. We talk about how you can differentiate yourself, how you can position your business when you're talking to somebody, uh, budgeting. Uh, we have classes. So we have two cohorts per year uh, called Lanzar. Which actually, uh, we have one cohort starting next week. Cohort? Is uh, that what it is? Yeah, so a... 10 week classes. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. And we have an instructor. So it's instructor led. And one cohort's in Spanish and one cohort's in English every single year. And those are all about? Uh, more about launching your business. Mm -hmm. So um, you talk about do I have an, a great idea? Um, do I, how do I do my bookkeeping? How do I put a strategy together? Um, what are the best types of ways to register the business? Cause there's a difference between, there's different tax benefits depending whether you register it as an LLC, corporation, sole proprietorship. Right, right. Um, and so they really go through those basics to make sure that once you launch it, and that's why it's called Lanzar, mm -hmm. that you are ready to go. Great. And ready to position it. Okay. And all these, um, for members and non-members as well, if you wanted to get some of the, the knowledge of how to even go about, if you have the little itch of becoming an entrepreneur, want to have a great idea, then you have a great idea. Yeah. You can actually really get honest feedback as far as like, it could be a great thing or you oh, might not want to hear it, but it might not be something that's going to make you any money. Yeah. And I think, uh, and more so I want to encourage people. Like mm -hmm. I won't discourage anyone. It is free for members and non-members, but we found that if we do take the time to educate and go through the process, they'll become members anyways, mm -hmm. especially if they're serious about growing their business. And so, um, uh, but yeah, I, I think the more so is just like we're, we, we can give a lot of feedback because we have 830 members that we're learning from. Yeah. And so really it's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, and then the, the other thing, um, that I forgot to mention is the, our certifications. So the typically if there's a government project or a city project, mm -hmm. um, and it could be mostly, it's mostly in construction, but there is a lot of different, uh, things that you can bid on, but the city puts out projects and sometimes they have a, um, like an equity goal, like they'll say that 30% of contracts will go to um, a minority business owner. And so um, because of that, um, the city would want minorities to apply to those bids. And so we have a, uh, a person in our staff um, that will help you get your certification. And then once you get your certification, when those bids are coming out from the city, it help you apply and bid for them. Because the city is looking for you to be able to have those in order to even be considered to have uh, a contract, right? Get the contract. Yeah. Mm. And really the, the certification just uh, verifies that. Um, it's like a verification process. Got you. Yeah. Get it's... your blue check with the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another thing that I like about y'all, uh, and we're running short on time, but I have a couple more questions, mm -hmm. is the thing that y'all do whenever you, you y all sit in sessions. Um mm -hmm. And tell me about that. What is it that you do exactly? And then uh, why Why would you want to be part of that? Uh, yeah. As far as a chamber for you to listen and take to the community. Yeah. Like the listening sessions? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I mean, it's really just about expanding your your um, ideology or reach or or figuring out different ways to do things. I'm, I'm talking about the legislation. Oh, legislature. Part. Yes. So you get to sit. I don't know if every chamber does, but I know y'all do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, for us. We have 830 members. Mm -hmm. What we do is we send out a survey to get feedback on um, on their business. What's working well? What's not working well? 
from a legislative standpoint. So what policies are helping you and what policies are hindering you? Mm -hmm. We put an agenda together and then that agenda, we talk to state representatives, local officials, and we'll present it in, uh, in Austin every legislative session. Mm -hmm. Legislative sessions are every two years. And this is where they introduce a lot of bills. Are they going to pass? Are they not going to pass? Right. But we're basically going out there and saying, this is what our members want. How can we help you guys help our membership? And, and because of that, it's like we're giving a huge voice to a community. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can open up, op open opportunities. If there's a law that passes that'll help out our business owners, I mean, that's something that's going to help them three years, four years, five years down the road. Okay. And so, yeah, it, it, it's, that's a way to create sustainability in the community. Okay. And then that also plays part of how important it is for people to vote. So exactly. I know you have a passion for it as far as letting people to know that they do need to, but how important, I know it's important, but you can tell me in your own words, why do you think people should be able to exercise their rights for, to, vote to vote and, and make voice their opinion on what the things that they want mm -hmm. to see in the legislature or bills or whatever? Yeah. And the way I see it is like the Hispanic community in the United States has a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I think 14.7% of eligible voters are Hispanic or Latino. And so you think about that, then we can make an influence in the federal level. At the local level in Texas, Hispanics are the majority. Mm -hmm. So really, if you think about that, Hispanics can, if everyone voted, we can influence how the state should look. Right. And then if we think about it, there's about, I think there's about 12 million Mexicans that can actually vote in the Mexican election, mm. which is crazy because now you're thinking about if our community was just engaged we can influence elections in mexico we can influence elections at the federal level at the local level at the state level we can shape out how this looks and maybe yeah. there could be a little bit more harmony or maybe there could be a lot more opportunities for everyone mm -hmm. but it's just exercising your right i mean it's it's you're part of this country and your kids are going to be part of this country and and you want to give them the best opportunity possible yeah i was talking to my brother today right because there's some new type of um immigration law that passed that they're going to be blocked because the state of Texas is going to block it for obvious reasons, right? But mm -hmm. I just became a citizen two years ago, mm -hmm. even though I've been um, um, a resident for many years. I exercise my right to vote. Yeah. But I think it's very important for people to exercise their vote. But as you mentioned earlier, like you have the section, the sessions and go listen in. They're beautiful. All these freaking politicians are great at getting to yeah. you have to vote for them. But at the end of the day, you're asking for my vote. I need you to be able to be deliver on the things that you're saying because they sing re a real nice tune until yeah. it's time to deliver what is necessary for both sides, yeah. not just for one. Yeah. So I, I, yes, please do vote. But also, please go show up to their, hey, what happened? Give me my vote. What yeah. happened? No. To deliver. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of democracy. I mean, if uh, there's a a person that you vote for and they're not, you know, uh, influencing the way you want them to influence, you should hold them accountable yeah. no matter what party it is. Yep. And uh, and that's that's part of it. Like at the end of the day, you're the voter. You're the one that has that right. And you are the one that can help shape everything. So. Power to the people, baby. Y'all got the power. <laughs> okay, before I let you go, uh, was there anything else in your mind that you wanted to discuss that you maybe thought on your way driving over here? Like, I, I hope he asked me about this. Or maybe we can touch him out a little bit. Anything else? I just appreciate the time. And I just hope everybody uh, does go out and vote. And if you haven't registered, register. Um, definitely as soon as possible. And uh, and just be on the lookout for events and uh, and information that we'll be sending out. Besides being one of the most active and more uh, amazing chambers out there, shout out to all the chambers, but I'm just saying personally speaking, why should one in the forward area, uh, I don't know if it's specifically in that region that y'all take or expand yeah. it, but why should one want to be part of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce? Because we have every resource that you could possibly need as an entrepreneur, whether you're first starting up or whether you've been in business 5, 10, 15 years, there's a way for you to get involved. The Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber. That's awesome. right. Awesome. Uh, all your social media, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? And do you have any other projects with your entrepreneur, your Marcus Foundation, or anything that you have going on, events or anything like that, projects? Yeah, just uh, my links on Gilberto Ataide. If you look me up on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, send me a message. I'd be happy to 
talk. Um, I love having one-on-ones with everyone just because I like hearing their story too. Mm-hmm. And it helps me find out how I can help them. So yeah. if definitely if you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or you've been in business, just feel free to reach out. Just Google him. Google Lele. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shout outs. Any shout outs? Saludos that you have for uh, anybody? Well, saludos to um, Christian for, you know, being a huge supporter. Yeah. Uh, really everybody in the chamber and the team. Um, and of course my family for pushing me Not the more I think about it, it was like, it really shaped my whole life. So yeah. uh, definitely family and, and everybody from, uh, Rio Grande Zacatecas cause, uh, they have been very, very supportive from Mexico. Every awesome. time I post something, they're, they're right there helping Mandales out. un saludo en español. Eh, sí, un saludo a toda la gente de Rio Grande Zacatecas. Muchas gracias por el apoyo. Y este, espero verlos pronto eh, eh, el, el fin de este año. Okay. Uh, what is an important lesson that you learned? Uh, working at the chamber that you or entrepreneurship uh, on your business that will help that will tell that you will tell your younger self that will help somebody else out what would that be i think uh just being uh a long life learner i think that was the biggest thing for me i love learning and uh, no matter what the challenge was or obstacle or whatever it is at the end of the day you always learn something and you're like okay this is taking me one inch closer to you know, a bigger goal. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, just take everything as a learning opportunity. Awesome. Okay. Usually when I wake up some or sometime during my day, I uh, say something along those lines. I'm not immortal. I am mortal and I will die one day. And it, I will die one day. I'm forgetting my words. <laughs> uh, and it's not an orig- original thought of mine. I heard yeah. it from a gentleman. I just liked it a lot. And I like to remind myself of that. You're not to scare me, to frighten me, terrorize me that I'm not going to be here. It's more of a Reminder of my mortality, reminder that I'm not here forever and I need to do as much as I can and take action on it as soon as I can. Oh, With that, yeah. I wish you a long, long, prosperous life. When everything's said and done, what do you want people to think and feel about your life? Uh, I definitely just want people to know that Hispanics do help each other out. And there is a lot of Hispanics that want to help each other out. So I'm my whole family was that way i'm gonna be that way my whole life because whatever you put on the community it'll always come back to you there's uh we had the discussion before about how i learned from a gentleman that a lot of the time it's like an unspoken thing if i help you out you're gonna help me out scratch yeah. my, whatever the case might be but it just keeps things flowing and going right I, I don't have to hold things that i have a refer for you if you can help them out but I know in return, without even me telling you, hey, make sure you take care of me, you're going to take care of me regardless at the end of the day. Yeah. Because you and, and the group of people that you work together have been doing it forever, right? So what is stopping you from referring somebody else? Like, if you can't do the job, why are you stopping somebody that needs a job, needs something done to have somebody else do it if you're not able to, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So why not? We do help each other out. Absolutely. We need a... Uh, there is a few people, like every freaking place in the world, <laughs> in the community, that a lot of times, for whatever reason, they're upbringing. Maybe they're just a little bit more selfish and want to do it just for them and not the best interest. But yeah. we got to weave them out and have the ones that really are willing to yeah. help the community, willing to help people out, uh, to to help each other out and, and push each other forward. Absolutely. You know? so. Come back. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the time. Again, immediately as I, as when I met you, I know you uh, you were amazing. And then I'm glad that Christian told you because I, I I do my thing and I try to focus on my regular uh, learning yeah. experience position that I do. But I do like to tell people that I do this because I, I, I there's so much freaking golden, amazing, beautiful stories at the chamber, such as yourself, such as Christian, such many others that I'm going to talk to sure. that I, I just... I just couldn't wait to also have you here and tell your story of everything that you got and and the eagerness, the 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 really heartfelt like the 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 way the passion that you really have for wanting to help the Hispanic community. You know what I mean? Without yeah, it, it could be almost for free, almost you will be able to do it. I'm glad yeah. you're getting compensated for it. But I just know how much passion you have for that. And I think it's contagious as far as me wanting to look after my community too. Yeah. And, and help us put in a better position. Absolutely. And without a doubt, Gilberto, you are a global land factor. Thank you so much for being All here. All right. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. This was another episode of the Global Land Factor podcast. Remember to subscribe. Suscríbete. No juegues. Don't play with me. And remember, we are just like you. We are humans. We are the spice in this melting pot. That it is the world. Till next time. Bus. Thank you very much for checking out this episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast. Make sure you go and subscribe to the channel and check out one of the other episodes that we have prepared for you. Thank you very much. Till next time.
looks like a pedo, but in fact is a flamingo. Coming to Havana and refining the river.